This video is supported by CuriosityStream. What's on your bucket list? I don't really have a bucket list myself, but if I did have one, one definite thing that would be on there is to see the Northern Lights. I've lived my whole life in the South. I've never seen them. I, I've seen videos of them. They look awesome, like nature. How you do that, yo? Of course, we know that the auroras are caused by a stream of charged particles that are blasted in from the sun. They get redirected to the poles by the magnetic field, which is why I'm making this gesture for some reason. Anyway, the stronger the stream of particles, the bigger and brighter the auroras are and the further south they go. So if I want to see the northern lights, I really only have two options. One, go up north where they're more likely to happen and uh, bring a coat. Or I could just be lazy and hang out here and wait for a big enough solar storm that I could actually see the auroras down here in Texas. As a general rule, I'm all about being lazy, but in this case, um, that might not be something I should hope for. Space wants to kill you. Thankfully, our magnetic field and atmosphere, as fragile as they may be, do a great job of protecting us against the fury of the cosmos. But it does have its limitations, and the more technological we become, the more vulnerable we are to those limitations. And this is something we discovered almost as soon as we became technological, when a massive solar storm hit the planet in 1859. On September 1st of that year, around 11.20 a.m., two astronomers, Richard Carrington and Richard Hodgson, independently observed what Carrington would later describe as patches of intensely bright and white light coming off the sun. This is actually the first solar flare ever actually described in a scientific journal. But the next day, some really weird stuff started happening down here on planet Earth. Uh, those auroras, for example, they stretched further south than they'd ever been seen before. That was probably pretty cool. What wasn't cool was the telegraph system, which went bonkers. Telegraph operators actually reported getting shocks from their equipment and seeing arcs of electricity blasting out from it. Some telegraph cables took on such a strong electromagnetic charge that they were able to actually send telegraphs without it being plugged into any power. And some operators actually received messages that weren't sent by anyone. They were just gibberish. Or were they? This caused widespread global outages, which was a big deal. Back in the 1850s, the telegraph was like cutting edge technology. It was the internet of its day. Today, that flare, the auroras, the telegraph weirdness, all that has come to be known as the Carrington event. Because screw that Hodgson guy, I guess. Scientists have examined archaeological evidence and historical records, and they've determined that this particular solar flare was the strongest one that's happened in 500 years. There have been others since then that have caused various levels of chaos, but nothing remotely close to this. Solar flares aren't actually harmful in and of themselves, but they can be accompanied by gigantic plumes of electromagnetic plasma called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. If you imagine the sun as a giant volcano, the CMEs are what happens when it erupts. Now, light only takes about eight minutes to cross the 93 million miles from the sun to the Earth, but CMEs and the plasma that they carry, they aren't massless like light is, so that can actually take a few days to reach us. But in the case of the Carrington event, it actually traveled a lot faster than we would expect it to. They actually think that an earlier CME may have kind of cleared a passage through the solar wind like some kind of cosmic uh, curling event. And what normally would take uh, several days to reach us only reached us in 18 hours. And they actually think this because auroral activity had actually spiked a little bit in the days before this event happened. And then when it did happen, it lit up the skies with auroras so bright that farmers down in the south actually like got up and started making breakfast and then realized it was like three hours before the sun was supposed to come up. Damn, son. Now let's be clear for a second. Solar flares aren't bad. They happen all the time. And the vast majority of them don't come anywhere near Earth because they can go in all these different directions. It has to line up just perfectly. So it's actually kind of rare that one of them hits us. But they do sometimes. In 2012, a CME comparable to that of the Carrington event hit the Stereo A satellite. The two Stereo satellites actually orbit around the sun and not the Earth. And they're made and designed specifically to measure and survive CMEs just like this. And what they learned was that if this particular solar flare had hit the Earth, it, it, it would have been bad. Some estimates say that in the U.S. alone, transformers would have been blown from Washington, D.C. to New York City and may have even gone as far south as Florida or my native Texas. This could have knocked out power for 40 million people, in some cases up to two years. And some estimate it would cost the economy somewhere between 600 million and 2.6 trillion dollars. It's kind of a ridiculous range, actually. This estimate is based partly on a blackout that happened in 1989 that knocked out power for 6 million people in Quebec for up to 9 hours. And it's estimated this blackout resulted in a loss of up to half a billion dollars for Hydro-Quebec, but it could have been a lot worse. This was only about a third the strength of the Carrington event. Interestingly, the space shuttle Discovery was actually in orbit when this flare happened, and it kind of did some weird stuff with the instruments. 
Yeah, they got a false pressure reading in one of the tanks that almost caused NASA to deorbit the space shuttle just to be safe. But this brings up a good question. We might be, you know, fairly safe down here on the ground, but what about up in space? The answer is it depends on where the astronaut is. The International Space Station actually has a special module just for that purpose. It's called the Zvezda mo module, and it's got special shielding on it that astronauts and cosmonauts can go into in the event of a huge solar storm. It's, uh, it's kind of like their own little panic room. And similar shielding on spacecraft can protect astronauts while they're in transit to the ISS, but what if an astronaut is, say, on a planet like uh, the Mars or even on the Moon? Because that plasma can carry with it high-energy particles that can actually scatter through the thin atmosphere of Mars and create a very dangerous situation for the astronauts below it. Spacesuits aren't thick enough to protect them against this kind of thing, and worse yet, some of these particles can actually travel faster than the CME itself due to the shock wave involved, and it can travel up to 80% the speed of light. Meaning by the time you see the solar flare, you just have minutes to get to shelter. Now on the Earth, we have that thick atmosphere that can block most of these cosmic rays, but on Mars or on the Moon, you could get hit with a lethal dose of radiation. In fact, there was something of a close call back in 1972 in between the Apollo 16 and 17 missions when uh, the moon was bombarded by high energy protons for 10 days. If anyone had been on the lunar surface when that happened, they probably would have been killed. Or best case scenario, had really bad radiation sickness and a high level you know, of cancer risk. Now, in addition to giving NASA chiefs nightmares, this particular 1972 CME hit the Earth actually faster than anybody thought was possible. It got here in only 14.6 hours. This was actually kind of a crazy event outside of what happened on the moon and the, the speed that it got here. It actually set off nuclear detection devices up in the Arctic, and it actually exploded mines in the sea off of North Vietnam. Yeah, magnetic uh, sea mines are rigged to detonate based off of shifting magnetic fields because large ships can uh, cause magnetic fields to shift as they pass by. But uh, yeah, apparently this storm was strong enough to set off several of them. And in case you're wondering how we knew that that nuclear detonation satellite was setting off a false positive, it's because that had actually happened before uh, in 1967. Only that time we'd never seen it before and it almost started, you know, World War III. This particular flare was strong enough to jam the signals, uh, the radar signals, in three different stations in the United States and in the United Kingdom, who just happened to be there with the purpose of detecting nuclear missiles coming over the North Pole. So if the USSR wanted to send nuclear missiles to the United States, probably one of the first things they would do is jam our radars. So that didn't look good. So of course the chiefs at those uh, bases thought that that's what was happening. Now we don't know exactly how far their plans might have been. Back in the day, bombers were in the air all the time, ready to drop a, a payload at a moment's notice. But luckily, cooler heads prevailed. They realized that it wasn't the Russians jamming the radar, it was actually the sun, and we didn't all die. As for the sun, they decided not to bomb it and let it off with a warning. This time. Well, considering all the trouble that these solar flares have caused, what would happen if a Carrington-style event happened today? In good news for the planet, but bad news for clickbait headlines, it actually turns out we'd probably be okay. There would be some outages around the world here and there, but most of it would be just kind of temporary. We might lose some satellites, the GPS system uh, might be, you know, temporarily affected, but we have plenty of extra satellites both in space and on the ground to make up for it. Basically, if you're a person who can't live for a single day without Wi-Fi, you'd be in trouble. But for the rest of us, a Carrington-style event wouldn't be something to lose sleep over. It would probably take a stronger solar flare than we've ever actually observed to really, really mess things up for us. And the chance of that happening is, is pretty slim. You know, the older a star gets, the more stable they become, so fewer and fewer of these events are likely to happen. It doesn't mean it can't happen. Actually, there was a study that was just released in the May issue of the Astrophysics Journal that expected that the sun still has enough go-go juice in it to produce something 100 times bigger than normal every 2,000 to 3,000 years. Exactly how 100 times stronger compares to the Carrington event is unclear, but I wouldn't want to be holding on to any telegraph lines when that happened. But even then, as I mentioned before, it has to be aimed right at us, which they almost never are. So an event of that type would probably only happen every 10,000 years or so. So is a super flare destined to change our way of life someday? It's kind of hard to say. That's still such a rare and newly understood phenomenon that we can't really know the answer to that. The authors of this study do think it's worth looking into, though. They recommend getting redundancy in all of our infrastructure and critical systems. Space wants to kill you. That's nothing new. The sun is mostly on our side, providing warmth and, and light and the occasional mutation. Luckily for us, the sun is old and stable. 
but it hasn't always been. We know this because we've looked out into the universe and we've studied other stars in various stages of development and it's given us a better understanding of where our sun's been and where it's going. And a great place to learn more about that if you're curious is an awesome two-part series called The Seven Ages of Starlight that you can watch on CuriosityStream. This is a series from the BBC that details the birth, life, and death of the stars in our universe that not only gives us a better understanding of stars and the forces that make them possible, but gives you more context the next time you look up at the night sky. This is one of literally thousands of shows on CuriosityStream that cover everything from science, history, nature, psychology, you name it. They need to change their name to Nerdtopia, really. CuriosityStream is kind of dangerous, actually, because I wind up binge watching their shows instead of making videos. You can get Curiosity Stream for free for 30 days if you go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. And after that, it's only $2.99 a month, which seriously, for the amount of content you get, it's a freaking steal. If you like my videos, I promise you will love Curiosity Stream. So go check it out, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, link down below. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters, my answer files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, forming a great community, doing cool stuff. I got some new people I need to shout out real quick. I'm gonna murder their names. There's a whole bunch of them, so bear with me. There's Ian O'Laughlin, uh, Chris Otto, JP Fagerback, uh, David Poirier, Lodeuz, D. Falk, Brian Beswick, Herman Solages, Jordan Caldwell, Blair Matson, Sebastian Bosley, Michelle Parker, Boris Johansson, uh, Zachary Rylas, John Carter, Revel Aiden, Joshua Davis, Rachel Black, Paul Spencer, DJ Brown, Tyler Hamm, Nathan Warkenton, uh, Michael Cal, Mighty Plow, Ellis Osley, Nicole Sarton, and uh, Craig A. Adams. Nailed it. Uh, if you guys would like to join them and get access to cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash Angela Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you can check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others down the side. And if you do like them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with fun science and future type videos every Monday and every Thursday. And while you're watching those videos, if you like any of the t-shirts that you see, they are available at the store with answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Uh, they're designed by a guy in Prague who does some really cool stuff. People seem to like them, so you can try it out yourself. Just go there and check it out. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you uh, next Monday. <laughs> Love you guys, take care.